left-hand side for Vieira, who will play through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back, and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Keller, and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna Podcast with me, your host, Harry Simeon. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by the returning Mike Stavrou. Mike, how you doing, mate? Looks like you've had a, a busy morning. How are you? Yeah, just hearing that intro has got me pumped, Harry. I can't lie, because you know I'm I'm sure like you, I like international football, but nothing beats watching the Arsenal and getting excited for a new season, having that hope, uh, having those dreams, and you're still really optimistic before uh, football's been kicked. Um, so I'm ready, man. I'm excited. Oh, I am so ready for the return of club football, and I'm not talking about pre-season friendly club football. I'm talking about the real deal. Um, I've I've, I've, I've been out to the Euros and I had a really, really good time at the Euros and it was a great experience and I'm so privileged to have covered it and I'm not complaining for a second. But then I came back and I needed a few days to kind of rest and, and recuperate and sort of get to the position where I feel like I was ready to go again. But I only needed three or four days. And ever since that kind of three or four day period mm. ended, I've just been so bored, to be honest with you. I've been... <laughs> doing stuff in the garden I've been chucking stuff out I've been doing all this home stuff that I normally try and avoid like the mm -hmm. plague and I'm very much ready for for club football to return just quickly on that you say the, kind of the hope piece are you hopeful that we can do it this year are you hopeful that this is the year that we finally topple Manchester City I, f I think so I I'm feeling quite confident actually and I don't really care if people come back and say oh you thought you were going to win it you know that typical thing and you bottled it um but i actually think that you know it's been it's been two seasons of proper title challenges and i think for us to even be in that position is so exciting as arsenal fans because we've really you know been for a tough time so even seeing that is incredible and i just go back to the last game of the season, Harry, and I think I said this on the last podcast, but I was in Islington for it and I was there from about 11 a.m. And I think the, the game started at three or four, whatever it was. And the atmosphere around it was one of celebration, even though we knew we weren't going to win it. Realistically, we knew that, that Man City weren't going to slip up. But it was just a party atmosphere because everyone was so happy at where we were and the fact that we got to a final day. And that was a huge achievement in itself. And I just think the the learnings over the last two years and and beyond that as well will come in handy. The players have experience; they they know what it's like getting to that final day, so they can definitely get there again. And then it's all about, you know, it's all about putting it over the line. And as Mikel says, those fine fine margins. And I think we can do it. Like I don't I don't think there's anyone out there saying that it's uh it's too far out of our reach to be honest. So if you don't believe it, what's the point, right? If you don't believe yeah. that you can do it having seen what Arsenal have managed to do over the last couple of seasons, then what on earth is the point in turning up? So I, I, I agree with you. You know, you need to be positive. You need to be hopeful. You need to be excited. You should be excited. I remember the Cronky said a long time ago, didn't they? Be excited. Well, finally, yeah. I think we're at that point where we can say that confidently going into each and every season. Right, what are we going to do on today's pod? We are going to react to an interview that Josh Cronky has given, the brilliant James Ollie over at ESPN sat down. Um, with Josh Kroenke and spoke about a number of subjects. He talked about how KSC's relationship with Arsenal has changed, taking inspiration from the Rams at the Super League fallout was touched on again. If KSC ever thought about selling and the fact that there are conversations starting over stadium work. So that's interesting. We'll get into all of that, but we're also going to do that age-old debate, isn't it? It feels like an age-old debate. Do Arsenal need a striker and I guess a good place to start Mike is because yeah you haven't been on for a little while what have you made of the summer so far it looks like 
Emil Smith Rowe's going. It looks like Eddie Nketiah could potentially be joining Marseille as well. We've heard in the last 24 hours that they've improved their offer for him. Um, so those are two potential outgoings. I think there'll probably be more outgoings as well. And David Raya has been signed on a permanent deal, which we all expected to happen. But the major signing, the major bit of news on the transfer front has been the addition of Ricardo Calafiori. So what have you made of that, first of all? Are you happy? Are you excited? And what still needs to be done in your opinion? Well, I think my main takeaway from all of this so far is that I'm happy that we've actually been able to sell more than one player, <laughs> it looks like, in a window, which, you know, sounds mad, but we've actually not been able to do that. We've had, you know, odd sales here and there. We got good money for Alex Iwobi. We got good money for Joe Willock. Uh, with, you know, Flo Balogun was a good deal, I think, especially based on how he's performed last season. But we've never actually been able to put our players in the shop window consistently and get fees for them. Um, so the fact that it looks like Smith Rowe is going to go for, a, I think, is you know, it's not great, but what is it about thirty-five million? It's a it's a decent fee considering he's not. Do you not? Played... Do you not? Do you not think it's great? I think it's fantastic. Is he's, he's not played Harry for for two years basically? He's you know he's not been a mainstay in the team uh, while we've been challenging for the title. So you'd have to go back to when we were when we were challenging for the top four to see when he was a real you know feature of the side, and that was that, that was a while ago. So. um you know, the fact he's not been able to get in there and showcase his talent consistently. Fulham are, are taking a bit of a gamble. And and that that's based on his quality, right? Because you just have to watch him to see what an incredible talent he is. Whether he can back that up consistently and do that throughout a season is another question question we've all had and, and levied at him as well. But I think it's, it's a really good deal. Um, it's obviously, you know, devastating to see him go first and foremost. He provided some, you know, incredible moments and, you know, really what is better than seeing an academy player flourish. There's nothing better for a, for a fan um, of a club, especially if you live local to them. Um, so, you know, he provided big moments like that Boxing Day win over over Chelsea. I think Arsenal had gone into that game on a, on a seven-game winless run, something like that. And, you know, there was talks of relegation back then. 2020 it was a pretty you know horrible time for a lot of us which is coming out of COVID as well and him coming into the side along with you know Saka and and, and Martinelli and, and Eddie as well I think at that time really lifted things um, and gave us some hope and saved Arteta's job in a way so you could say without because I think he came in for, for a run of games he'd been injured before it was a few years ago I can't remember exactly what, what game it was but I think that Chelsea game he came in uh, after not starting for the for the season before that it was his first start in the Premier League at least, and he and he kind of saved us in a way because he was that creative player that we'd been missing. Um, see, this is what happens with Smith Rowe. I get talking about him and I get emotional. <laughs> I'm sure everyone does. Is that, is that a tear running down your face? <laughs> it is, but he's one of the ones I think. If if you would have asked us a few a few years ago, who would you be most sad to lose? I think most fans would say Saka or Smith Rowe, right? Those two. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have that connection to them, as you say, but I think we needed to get ruthless on this and and we have. And I think we've managed it all in a really smart way in that there's never been a public kind of, well, we need to get this guy out. Like Arsenal have been putting out noises, particularly at the start of the summer. You know, well, Emil Smith-Rowe's got every opportunity here. You know, we want to see him do well. You know, there were reports saying that the player wanted to stay at the club. And what that meant was that if anybody came in and tried to prize him away, they were going to have to seriously test Arsenal's resolve. They were going to have to come in and make a very, very appealing offer. And I think that to get north of £30 million in total for someone that, as you say, has barely kicked the ball for two years, I think that's fantastic. I think that's really, really good business. And I think you're right. Fulham have taken a bit of a gamble. It's a record fee for Fulham as well which I know we've touched on in recent episodes, but that says a lot about how much they believe in in his ability to impact their team and help them grow and move forward, etc. So, yeah, I think it's good business for, for everybody all around, particularly from an Arsenal side. And I think it's something that for Emil Smith-Rowe just, just simply needed to happen. Ricardo Calafiori, how excited are you mm. about that signing? He's already got the best hair in the Premier League. Um, <laughs> he's already the coolest guy in the Premier League. We are yeah. one of the best footballers in the Premier League is, I guess, what's more important. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting signing and 
I looked at, um, I saw a tweet, I think it was Sam Dean. I think he said, since Arteta's come in, he's spent, was it 240 million or something on defenders? About 11 defenders. And it was really interesting to me because I look at the the profiles of our defenders and they're all so versatile. And I don't re- ever remember a time in the in the Premier League for, for any team apart from Man City who just, you know, spend, spend, spend. I don't remember a team ever having like an exciting array of, you know, different players that, you know, can play inverted or they can play left and right back or they can play centre back and left back or right back and centre back or or in Tommy Asu's case, every position in in the defence. And I think what that does is that provides us such an amazing uh, array of, of opportunities and different ways to play and play styles and you know, horses for courses against different opponents. You know, Arteta might look at a game against Liverpool and think, oh, Tommy Asu's done really well against Salah before. Let's put him there. Or he might look at a game where we need more in the build-up. So, Calafiori, you, you're good at charging forward and you can play inverted and in midfield as well. You play there. So, I think I'm, I'm really excited with it as a whole. I mean, Calafiori, obviously, I've not seen much of him outside of the Euros. I'm sure a lot of people are the same. But what I saw was... A really exciting defender, which you don't really say too much about defenders, but um, he just seems to have all of the the ball playing skills that you'd want, um, plus the defensive capabilities as well, um, and as you say, plus the uh, the good looks, which which help <laughs> help on the eye. Um, so so yeah, I'm mean, I'm excited. I'm I'm happy with the options we have now, and I think Arteta said in a press conference recently he wants eight fit senior defenders um I mean I don't quite think that's going to happen with our injury record but the fact he's almost looking at that and saying you know defense is arguably I I would say from the outside point of view it seems like the most important thing right now in for for Arteta in terms of how the the team played last season and in terms of the first signing we've made this summer well if you want to play kind of front-footed high-pressing football which we know that Arsenal want to play in an ideal world, then you need to have individuals at the back that are capable of dealing with 1v1 situations. You need to be able to push up aggressively as a unit and trust that Saliba, for example, is going to win his one-on-one duel. You need to trust that Gabriel is going to win his. And I think that's partly why Mikel Arteta wants these almost monster defenders, like big, physical, powerful guys. They've got to be able to play the game to the standard that we require when we try and lure teams out. We need to be able to pop the ball around them. And all of these guys have that ability. But also the the physical aspect is really important because you want to believe that you can push up and you can leave those guys in those 1v1 situations. And there's very or there's a very good chance that they'll be able to come out on top in those duels. And the physical side of it is a big part of that as well as being, you know, technically very, very gifted. You're right. Defense is super important to Mikel Arteta. And I think when you look at our defensive record, particularly last season, he's justified in sort of making that a priority because it means that you can win games by the odd goal. It means that, you know, you can decide a game basically by attacking a set piece well. And we did plenty of that last season as well. And it just shows that, you know, without that defensive core, it would be harder. And and so he's realized that that first and foremost is the priority. And if you've got that stable platform, then you don't always need to be at your brilliant best going forward. You just need to take a moment when it comes along. And that more often than not can be enough to win the game. I do want to dive into this uh, Josh Kroenke interview. We'll do that right after this very, very short pause. Um, We're going to talk about what Josh Kroenke has had to say out on Arsenal's US tour. Okay, so as mentioned at the top of the programme, he talked about how KSE's uh, relationship with Arsenal has changed, uh, the inspiration that he's taken from the Rams and some of their other, uh, of course, sports franchises. He's talked again about uh, turning the reputation around as far as KSE are concerned because the Arsenal fans, particularly after the Super League uh, thing, you know, turned up in their tens of thousands at the Emirates Stadium to protest against the ownership. Interestingly, Mike, he was asked if during that time KSE ever considered selling and he said, no, not really. Something along the lines of, you know, we invest in the long term. But surely as an ownership group of something that means so much to so many people, 
when the masses turn against you, you're surely considering your position. I know he said that they weren't, and I know he said that it never really crossed their mind. And he also, I think, went out of his way to kind of make the point that there was all this talk of bids and stuff. And, and you remember Daniel Ek, the Spotify um, sort of boss coming out and, and you know, making it clear that he was interested in the football club. But from what Josh Kroenke said here, A, they never considered selling, and B, nobody got as far as actually making a bid. So was that all just hot air now in hindsight? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think it's to do with timing because they obviously took full majority control in 2018. And I think when those calls were really at their... Was it... So Super League was... Just remind me what, what, what year that was again, because I think it what, was quite close to them taking over, right? Yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah. You had the Super League stuff. You had the COVID impact as well. Mm. And that led to a few other controversies, i.e. Uh, making redundancies. The club made, I think, 55 mm. redundancies. And Gunnosaurus was one of them. And I remember everybody being upset about the dinosaur <laughs> yeah. losing his job and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it, it, was, it, it was near to the time, right? So I yeah. think if it hadn't been so close to them taking majority ownership um and it'd been you know long sustained uh you know protest from the fans then i think maybe they would have considered it more but i just when you sort of take over a company speaking from someone who has loads of companies <laughs> like arsenal um but you know you, it's it, it's about the long term and i think jo like josh Conkey made that made that point it was about putting the things in places so you know, I'm talking about a completely new hierarchy because, you know, the article goes in into it and says, uh, you know, when Wenger left, there was a whole raft of changes. I've, Ivan Gazidis left straight away. And then when the Cronkies took over majority, they had to put their own things in place in, to completely change from how the ownership looked before. So that was always going to be a long term process, I think. And, you know, it took a few years. Edu came in, got promoted. There was different different sort of directors coming in and there's there's been slow slow change but i think they're at a point now where they're finally seeing the fruition of what what they put in place and i i think for me and us i'll you know try and think of other arsenal fans in this as well and if you disagree let me know but i think things kind of changed when josh came into the picture because for so long you know we, we called him Silent Stan. He never spoke about Arsenal. We never did media interviews, never spoke spoke to us. And even though a lot of these media interviews, fans will say, you know, that it's PR, it's, you know, it's just hot air, it, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. The fact that we had someone at the top of Arsenal speaking directly to us for the first time, I think that made a huge difference because it just puts a, a face to the name and says, okay, this is who's running our club. Maybe it's not going quite well at the moment, but the fact you know, he's given those sound bites like be excited and, and things like that. It gave us something to go on. So I think yeah. things slightly changed after that. And then obviously, if we were still shit, <laughs> I wouldn't be saying this, but we, we gave them, I think, a bit of the benefit of the doubt to get that new structure in place and get it working functionally. And now we're seeing the, the, the benefits of that. So the fact that they did, they saying that they didn't consider an offer, I mean, you know, Maybe it's true. I'm not sure. Like we have to take it on face value from from what what Josh Cronkey says, but it doesn't surprise me too much. I would say. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. I always felt like the kind of Daniel X stuff was a little bit. I don't know. It, it kind of felt like you know all fart no shit. There wasn't really any kind <laughs> of you know substance to to what we were hearing. We just saw someone pop out. You know, who's obviously a very notorious business person owns you know arguably the biggest music streaming platform in the world clearly got a bit of money behind him but even then there were question marks over whether he had enough behind him to be able to tempt the Cronkies into selling because this is the biggest privately owned sports group in the world KSE so they're not in a position where they desperately need money they've built a monster of an empire um, apologies if you can hear a bit of drilling in the background my neighbors decided to fix his fences during the podcast of course um but yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting that when you read this stuff with hindsight, isn't it? That you know, obviously you've got time mm. if you're KSC to get your story straight and say what you want to be saying and all the rest of it. But if yeah. there was no bid, then there was no bid, and and all of that was just a load of nonsense. Yeah, and also Harry, I think like um, it's it's been proved to be a great business decision. Like, look at what they've got now, um, and how you know that that asset 
Arsenal, we're talking about 2018, 19, 20. Like, look how much has grown since then. Like, yeah. the fact that they had that, you know, uh, sports business franchise and they've dealt with this sort of stuff before. They've, they've gone through ups and downs, I'm sure, with all of their teams. The fact they had that 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 acumen and that knowledge it just proved to them that you know we're in the early stages here and it and it is going to get better so you, you you've got to commend them on that really because i think you know at, at one point as arsenal fans and you know we are fans and we're emotional we would have looked at it and said you know i can't see it getting any better for us we've just lost arsene wenger our best manager ever and you know unai emery's just been sacked and we've got a a, a manager who's who's never managed before like that you know, it was scary. So, you know, you can say, like, commend them for, for sticking with it, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, he was asked whether KSE will ever get the love uh, from the Arsenal fans, given everything that has gone before. And Josh said, I don't know. I'd hate to say I don't really care because it is a really big group of people. My dad has given us the ability to invest back into the club in a way that maybe wasn't done previously. But he does that because he trusts the group of people that we have. Uh, we're in this business because we're competitive. It's a lot to process at times. But the only reason we're here is because we've got a great group and we want to try and keep it together for as long as we can. So he, he made the point again, Arsenal have found ways of being able to invest in the team and they weren't able to do so in the past. Now, on the one hand, I, I I agree with that and I commend the fact that they've obviously been really smart from a business perspective, restructured certain things. Um, I know that they've taken on loans that the club had um, and, you know, made those loans essentially owed to KSE, which meant that they could bring the interest rate down, which meant that Arsenal could have a little bit more wiggle room and were able to do business. And we know that the building of the Emirates Stadium had a mega impact on our finances and what we were able to do. But when he says, my dad has given us the ability to invest back into the club in a way that maybe wasn't done previously, I, I get that, Mike. But part of the reason that we weren't able to invest was because them and, and the Usmanov kind of consortium were both fighting for full control of the club. And it was like, well, I'm not going to invest money because if I do, it's going to drive your share price up, which makes it harder for me to then buy from you and vice versa. So that was happening mm. on both sides. So they are part of the reason that we couldn't invest during that period as well. Not all of it, because they didn't build the stadium, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But they were a part of that problem too at one stage. Yeah, and it would have been good to hear Josh's thoughts on that. And, you know, that that is the question that that you need to be, that that you need to ask next. It's that, okay, this is great talking about how, how well it's going now and how we're all happy, but there was a long period where you were there and, and we didn't see that investment. And we went through a really, really tough time. You know, Arsene Wenger had to consistently pull a rabbit out of the hat with the limited resources he had while seeing his best players go year after year, especially in the sort of early years after after the breakup of the Invincible. So, yeah, I mean, that that would be good to hear his his opinion on on why that didn't happen and and, and i'd guess it would be for the reasons that, that you just outlined that the, the fact that there was that battle no one had the the majority ownership and as, as you say there's difficulties there um you know there's when when you have that split ownership there's decisions that that need to be put at a board level and you've got board members from from different sides um so it's harder to push things through so I, it must have been a tough situation, but us as Arsenal fans, we would we went for a really tough period, and we, I, I think, just going back to what I said, it was the communication. The communication wasn't there. We we were never told why we're not spending money. Um, you know, Wenger communicated as as well as he could that we're we're in debt from the stadium, but it was never explained why that investment couldn't have been put in from from elsewhere or or anything like that. So. So yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one, but I would have liked to see that answer yeah, there, really. For sure, for sure. Um, he talked about potential stadium works. Now, there have been questions uh, recently about the size of the Emirates Stadium. There are some aspects of the Emirates Stadium, I think, as well, Mike, that need updating. I mean, I, I know this sounds pathetic and maybe a little bit pedantic, but I hate the fact that I walk into the Emirates Stadium and the red on the sort of seats is all faded. Mm. Like that really annoys me. Mm. Like have a bit of pride. Like it's like, you know, it, it just, yeah, it just doesn't look right to me. Like I get moaned at 
if a room in my my house needs painting because my wife says have a bit of pride like come on hmm. and and i look at that and i just think can you imagine my wife was in charge of the emirates stadium like what would happen they'd be all painting every single day of the week and and year but i just yeah I, things like that do need improving but the, the question was centered around kind of you know renovations but also i guess expansion hmm. and um this is what josh said he said it would be premature to talk about any plans in depth but the internal conversations are starting to occur about the stadium. It's not an easy renovation, but we see the possibilities of what's there. First of all, what do you think about the idea of expanding Emirates Stadium? You know, it's a, around about 60,000 capacity at the moment. We know that over the last two seasons or so when Arsenal have been performing really well, the demand for tickets has gone through the roof and there's a lot of people unfortunately missing out on tickets as a result mm. of that. Do you think we should be looking to expand? Because... There's a part of me that thinks yes, but then there's a part of me that thinks, well, where, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but where were all these people three years ago when we were playing Barté Borisov and we couldn't even half fill the stadium? Like mm. that's, that's kind of my way of looking at it. I'd, you'd rather have a stadium that is full and have that demand because that allows you as a business to put the prices up, et cetera, and, and people will, will, will accept that. But I don't know, like, how much further can you expand it without it sometimes being empty is, is, is I guess, my question. Yeah, and, and that's a fair point, you know. I, I think that there has been a lot of fans um, that that I speak to that have only become Arsenal fans in the last few years. And it's just like, <laughs> it's, it's to be expected, but it's a bit frustrating on a personal level when you think, yeah, we've literally had to, you know, see all the shit. And now we're we're here and fully enjoying it, but that that's going to happen. But I can speak from my own personal experience. I mean, um, my dad had a season ticket, um, and for the first four years of the Emirates, he was yeah. on the waiting list for eighteen years before that to get that ticket. So you know, demand for season tickets has always been high, especially with the new stadium as well. Back in two thousand six, he he didn't have it for that long yet, for about four seasons, and and, and I went with him. Unfortunately, I had to give it up due to you know outside circumstances. Um, but what that what's that resulted in is that I've only ever been Canon Club when I was sixteen, and then now a Red member, and I'm on the waiting list for a season ticket, and I'm forty eight thousandth in the in the waiting list. And I got an email a few weeks ago saying you've moved zero places in the <laughs> in the waiting list. So way, I'm going to be way waiting to give a while you some heart, eh? way to give you encouragement. I know. Guys. Because but because who's given up their season ticket? No one. Like no one's given up their yeah. season ticket because we, we are at the peak right now of the of this project. Um and it's hard to get tickets. I think last year I probably went to about 10 games in total. Um if only a few of them through the ballot because the ballot's really difficult to to get into. Um we're talking about accessibility. I mean, it, it's really hard unless you know someone who's got a season ticket and can give you the odd ticket. It's really tough to to get one these days. So I mean, I personally would welcome a, a stadium expansion. I think that the difficulty is, is how do you do it? It's quite a confined space around the Emirates, right? It's If you're going to make it bigger, I, I struggle to see how you're going to fit that into the surrounding area. You know, you've got flats really close. Um, you've got you know, on both sides uh, and then around the other sides, it's not far until you get to, you know, a bit of pavement where I guess you could extend outwards, but there's not the space to do it from from the sort of oval ends I, I'm, I'm looking at it from. So, I think my, I think my uh, thing with the expansion is, is it's not necessarily about making the, the the outside of the stadium bigger. I think one of the problems that we have at the Emirates, and I say problems because it's not really a problem, but one of the reasons that we've got the capacity that we've got is because I don't think we've built particularly the lower tiers steeply enough. Does that make mm. sense? Like I went to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium mm. uh, for our game against them at the back end of last season. That was my that was my second time there. I'd been there as a fan the year before, but that was my second time there. Um, and this time I was in the press section, so I was kind of at the top of the lower tier, um, sort of around about the halfway line. And I couldn't believe how steep the steps were down in comparison to Emirates Stadium. And I thought, well, that's a way, isn't it, of getting way more people in the stadium. So maybe there's yeah. there's something that can be done mm. internally rather than having to expand on the outside. 
we need to turn this into the chronicles of the architect because clearly both of us but no it's yeah. it's, it's 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 a fair point because i i went to unfortunately went to the spurs stadium last year and uh i was sat about three rows from the back and um the viewing angle was insanely good because of look because like you say because it's steeper you're closer to the action whereas at the emirates my my dad's seen ticket for the first season was four rows from the back and you felt like you were in the gods you lit it's literally you feel so disconnected from the action yeah. the atmosphere up that weren't wasn't fantastic and even coming down like 10 rows is like a whole new experience so i agree with you um but I think when we're talking about like structural changes, that's that's a big project. That's a year out of the stadium at least, right? And then it's and then yeah. it's the whole question of wh where do we play? Like, do we go to Wembley and play? Yeah, I'd, I'd hope that we could Not do something ideal. like what what Liverpool have done, where you're kind of like expanding a section during the season. Maybe the bulk of the work gets done over the summer. I don't know. I don't know. But that's we, not gonna that's not gonna max out the capacity as much as you might like. I think no, like, maybe not. Maybe not. It sounds like what just reading through the lines. It sounds like Josh wants a full-on renovation, not just sort of like aesthetics. It sounds yeah. like we want to bolster it by a lot, and that you know that to me says maybe we want to boost it by about I don't know five, six, seven thousand maybe. And and I yeah. think that's a big renovation. If it's more, then it's more like what I'm talking about with you know le needing to leave for a year which would be less yeah. than an idea. But, you know, the fact that we're even having these conversations, I think is good because, as you say, Emirates Stadium, the concourse, is it's looking a bit knackered, isn't it? There's, yeah, I know that, that, just needs, that just needs sprucing up a little bit. Like, it's just yeah. grey yeah, concrete. Yeah. Like, that just needs spray. They did it with the outside, up. didn't they? So I don't yeah. know why they can't spruce yeah. things up inside and make it a bit more of a, a nicer experience. It's just, it's, it, it feels like an old stadium now. It, it, it does, you know. Yeah. It's almost if they, if they, you, it's almost if they just painted old. the seats, I'd be happy. I, honestly, like if You'd they just painted the seats, I'd be happy with that. I just want it to look lush when you walk in, mm. instead of like. And honestly, I know this sounds like I'm I'm nitpicking, and we'll come on to the striker chat in a minute because I'm mm. just conscious of time. But like, there's been games, right? So there's been games where I've turned up in a pair of jeans and I've been leaning on my seat, and I've walked away from the stadium and I've got red paint marks on the back of my jeans where I've been leaning on the seat. Like, what is that about? Like, what, what yeah. is that about? Like, people pay a fortune yeah. to come to the game yeah. and they have to buy a new pair of jeans after. So I know I sound like I'm being a one of those miserable old gits that moans about everything, but like that kind of thing is just embarrassing. Like, if you're a, an elite football club, you need to you need to come across that way. It's so important that the optics are right as well. Um, just final point I want to make on this uh, Cronky interview. Um, he talked about the impact that COVID had, and there was a, a bit in this article that was attributed to football finance expert Kieran Maguire uh, a little while ago. And he said that Arsenal for many years were one of only two clubs regularly getting into the £100 million a year bracket for match day income. This was often 20% or more of their total revenue, whereas the average in the Premier League is around 13%. And for some clubs, it's as low as 4%. So, when Josh Kroenke sits there and says that COVID had a big impact and that Arsenal were, were really up shit street as a result of COVID, I think that really kind of proves the point. The fact that it was such a big portion of our overall revenue and to lose that just at the drop of a hat was obviously really, really impactful. Um, but anyway, let's uh, let's move on and we're going to talk about strikers. Do Arsenal need a striker? I've got quite a strong opinion on this and I'm interested to get Mike's thoughts as well. We'll be back right after this very, very brief pause. Don't go anywhere. You are listening to the current cause of a Guna. Like and subscribe. You heard the man. Like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review as well. Make sure you give Mike a follow. His details will be in the description below. Okay, Mike. Do Arsenal need a striker this summer? We've got a defender in. I think we all believe that a midfielder is probably coming in. At the time of recording this, it looks like Mikel Marino is the most likely option. But do Arsenal need a striker as well? What's your take on this? I think if the question is, do they need a striker to win the Premier League? My 
the the answer is no. Do they need a striker in the longer term and in terms of getting a, a focal point? And, you know, potentially if Gabriel Jesus moves on, doesn't look like it'll be this summer now, given how Arteta's speaking about him in the press um, and given his performances, then then yes, I, th- I, I think we will. But for this season, I think, you know, we got extremely close without having a number nine not last season, basically. You know, Havertz was brought in primarily to play as a midfielder and then he ended up being a marvel up front. And then we flitted between Jesus and Enketia. Um, so the fact we got there without one says to me we can do it. Obviously, you know, would you turn down a minimum 20 goal a year striker? Obviously not. But the, the reality is a player like that is going to cost you upwards of 100 million. And I think there are other priorities in the squad right now um, above striker that that need to be sorted. It's pretty simple for me. Like in an ideal world, I would love us to bring in that cold-blooded killer in front of goal. What fan in the world doesn't want one of those in their team? Everybody does. But there's two concerns I have. The first concern, Mike, is what does that take away from the rest of our build-up, which has enabled the likes of Saka, Trossard, Odegaard, Rice even, to start contributing sort of significant amounts of goals? Because if you look at at Kai Havertz, for example, when he came in, yeah, he scored a a fair few goals in the second half of the season. But his biggest asset and biggest attribute, I would say, is his ability to bring others into the game. We could go long to him and he could bring the ball down and he could bring others in. He showed that he could run in behind. He showed that he could drop into deeper pockets and then make those runs and often do them untracked and get in behind and cause people problems. Is he the best finisher on the planet? No, he's not. And would I bet my house on him scoring a one-on-one with a goalkeeper? No, I wouldn't. But the the amount of opportunities and, and sort of situations he is a big part of generating makes him a really, really important player. And the same can be said of Gabriel Jesus in his first season at Arsenal. And I think that Gabriel Jesus is going to come good again. I don't think he became a bad player over the course of a few months. I think he had injury problems and he struggled to find fitness. But now that he's having a full preseason, I'm hopeful at least that he's going to rediscover some of that form again. And again, be that guy that maybe isn't the cold-blooded finisher, but brings so much to the side overall. I put out a tweet last night or an X, what do you call them nowadays? I don't even know, um, where I talked about this. And it's probably the most I've ever thought about a post before putting it out. And I basically said, I like Jokeres, but I wouldn't pay anywhere near his release clause. I'm no longer convinced by Ossiman, certainly not as convinced as I was maybe two seasons ago. Tony doesn't feel like the right fit to me and Sesko has opted to stay in Germany. Arsenal spent big on Rice because he was a sure thing, but I can't say that confidently about any of the strikers we're being linked with. Can you? So I'll put that question to you, Mike. Like all these names, Giocares, Ossiman, Tony, Sesko, um, are any of them a sure thing? And if they're not, how can you justify spending mega amounts of money on them? Yeah, and it's, um, I mean, I can't. Out of, out of those names you mentioned, I mean, I, it's strange because I think if you asked me in January, I really wanted Ivan Tony. I thought he he looked a really, really good fit for us in terms of us wanting that target man. Um, but I think not only has he gone off the boil a little bit, in in the last few weeks of the season um the interest around him has dropped as well so obviously you know the the price has dropped as well but i think there's there's a reason for that because he's he's form fell off and also the the other factor with with tony is that i think havertz does a lot of the things that tony does off the ball but better i think he's you know he's really good defensively havertz um he's good with pressing he's physical um i don't think you get get that off the ball work from tony um, but in terms of his, you know, being a target man, I think Havertz can do that as well. So I think sort of almost half of his role that a Tony would bring in is is being fulfilled. Um, obviously, you don't have the the clinical nature in front of goal. That's the that's the big thing, really, and that's the thing that we would all like. But as you say, I think that kind of does take away from the build up. And you know, just looking at our sort of goal scorers last season, all comps, you know, Saka twenty. Trossard 17, Odegaard 11. Uh, Martini was a bit down for previous season on eight. That means that like the goals are being shared around. 
So obviously what happens when you get a striker and a, a number nine who's less good with build up, as we've seen with Haaland and City, the, the productivity from the wings and from midfield gets lessened and you rely on someone up front to score the majority of the goals. And I, I'm not sure we're not going to get a dead cert like Haaland. That's not going to happen. So you're talking about Gokarez and Tony and Osimhen. I don't think any of them come in right now and score, I don't know, 25 goals uh, confirmed. You know, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. I sound like Rich Romano. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so we're not going to get that. Um, so I don't think it's worth sort of changing the entire setup of the attack, um, both wingers and the and the number eights to accommodate that. Um, so I'm with you, really. And I think that we can do it without them. We need certain players to step up. And, and I think, you know, Gabriel Martinelli had a really disappointing season. Uh, I don't know what happened with him, um, but we need him to to step up. Um, it was really good that Trossard came in because he he pushed him, I think, further and challenged yeah. his, 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 his position. Um, but I think we need the whole team to be functioning. I mean, my just slightly going away from the striker a, a little bit, and I want to get your thoughts on this. My bigger concern is back up for Saka. Like, we can't yeah. run him into the ground again. He can't play that many games as he did last season and be that, you know, relied upon. Like, I worry about him and I, and, and I worry that he's been injury-free for such a long time, but he's been playing games since he was 17 consistently. And what, he's 22 now. And he's playing and he's a huge player for not only us, but England as well. So that would be my primary concern at the moment, getting someone in that can challenge him for, for minutes and push him on as well because there's levels he can go to as well. Yeah, for sure. And with Saka, and it's a great point, it's not even just about him being sort of rested completely. It's about having that ability, I think, to be 2-0 up in a game on 70 minutes and just saying, right, that's it. You know, you've you've done your bit, Bukayo, and hook him off and know that the person you're bringing on doesn't really impact the level of the team too much. And, you know, if you was to save him 20 minutes every three games, you'd still be saving a lot of game time for him and you'd still be sort of protecting him a lot more. So I'm I'm realistic in the fact that I don't think there's many players out there, if any at all, that Mikel Arteta is going to identify, go and sign and say, oh, well, all of a sudden Bukayo Saka's starting position is up for grabs. I don't, I don't think that's the reality. I think someone that can come in and can finish games or... Um, you know, just protect Saka when we need that, I think is is really, really important. But I guess, yeah, with the striker point, you know, going back to that for a minute, we'd all like one in an ideal world. We've got two very good forward players in Havertz and Jesus. Um, and I think they can both make a big contribution. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, it's not even about the money. Like whenever I say stuff like this, everyone goes, oh, here he goes again. The Arsenal accountant doesn't want to spend any of their money and it, as if it's his own money. And it's nothing to do with that. Like I just, if there was an obvious choice, if there was an obvious option that really made sense, I'd be all for going north of 100 million to get that deal done. I.e., if for me, Alexander Isak became available, I'd yeah. do it. I'd pull the trigger. I would absolutely do it. But Victor Giocares, can I be convinced about him? Like, with all due respect, he made his name playing for Coventry in the championship and has gone to the Portuguese Primeira Liga, which isn't anywhere near the levels of the Premier League, if we're being honest. And he's done well there in one of the league's better teams. Fine, not taking anything away from him, but there isn't enough tangible evidence for me that he could come into the Premier League and do it. Victor Osimhen isn't at the level that he was two seasons ago. There's no doubt about that. Napoli are in a bit of a shit position at the moment because they've brought in Antonio Conte. He wants Romelu Lukaku, but that means moving Victor Osimhen on. Maybe towards the end of the window, there'll be an opportunity to get Victor Osimhen for significantly less than the 100 million price tag that Napoli put on him initially. But you don't know how that's going to play out. Ivan Tony, not for me. Um, I was never convinced by him for a number of reasons, but I think when he came back from that suspension, he needed to do more in terms of convincing people that he was ready to take that next step. And it's no wonder that nobody's been willing to pay the price that Brentford are asking. The one that I started to come around to the idea of was Benjamin Sesko because I felt like the price wasn't ridiculous. The potential is there. And if he came in, I would very much be of the mindset 
well, he's here, he's an option for us, but he's not so expensive or such a big name that we have to now build everything around him. What we can do is slowly blood him in and and use him to his strengths and, and maybe in time that will prove to be fruitful for us. But he's decided to stay at RB Leipzig. So you don't just spend big money for the sake of it. You know, fix other areas in the team, you know, and, and also what the fans' priorities are might not always be in line with Arteta's. I bet nobody would have said going into the summer that we haven't got enough defenders in the squad. But that's what Mikel Arteta said, and that's why he went out and got Ricardo Calafiori. So sometimes yeah. we have to understand that what we think isn't necessarily what they're seeing on the training pitch day in, day out, I guess. Yeah, and also I think for me, in terms of improving to start in 11, if we go to what worked for us in the second half of the season when Havertz was was up front, um, Declan Rice was at eight and Jorginho at six. I think there's a clear upgrade there. Jorginho as the six. If we're going to move forward and want to compete with City on a consistent basis, just look at the the differences in sixes that that we both have. They've got Rodri, the best in the world, and we've got you know a great you know experienced, um, reliable, trustworthy player international um, with with Italy and Jorginho brilliant but is he going to be the difference in us making that step up i don't think so so yeah for me absolutely. just looking at it i think that that is the priority position because i've seen declan rice at six you know quite a lot but i still think he's a number eight i just think his best abilities are utilized when he's playing a bit further forward in terms of he's off the ball and and on the ball as well um so that's what i would like to see whether that's going to happen I'm not I'm not sure. Obviously there's talks of Mikel Marino as well, which would mean he's more of a number eight. So that would mean Declan Rice playing at number six a, a little bit more. So I mean we've it's interesting because we've had this debate last year when Rice came in. And I don't think any of us still know where he's gonna play really <laughs> con consistently. Yeah, it's it's difficult to know. I, I think for me, Rice when he first came in, he played at six. Obviously, that was in the absence of Thomas Partey, and he looked phenomenal. He looked really, really good. But over time, I think we began to learn that ball progression isn't really his thing. Like, he, he's great at carrying the ball forward, but as the six, you can't really do that that often because you end up being exposed if you get caught in possession. You kind of need to move it forward without leaving your zone so much. And I think at the Euros as well, and I, I don't for a second blame all of England's problems on Declan Rice, but I think that became apparent there as well. And I think Arteta was right in the second half of the season to push him further on and having Jorginho in that deeper position. And then Partey, when he returned, it kind of shone a light for me on what they have that maybe Declan Rice doesn't. Um, that's not to say he wasn't worth the money. That's not to say he's not been a transformative signing, but players have their own skill sets, right? And I think that Declan Rice's strengths, I could probably name you five or six strengths before we get to the ball progression bit, whereas with Jorginho and Partey, that's right at the top of their lists. Uh, it's, I think so much of it as well, Mike, depends on Partey. If he's fit and he can get himself into the kind of shape where he can play most games, then when he's available, he's, he's as good as anyone, so you'd play him. But if he's not going to be available and, it, you know, we don't even know for sure that he's going to be at the club at the minute. He looks like he mm. will stay, but you just never know. You might get an 11th hour bid from from somewhere, you know, in the Far East, big uh, sort of Middle East, big money. And you never know. Um, maybe he goes. But yeah, I mean, on the striker debate, I think we're I think we're aligned on that. Um, I'd, we'd love one, but it's got to be the right one. And it can't just be a striker signing for the sake of it, because. To me, the midfield still needs more work first. Yeah, um, and I think we've got enough without without it. And as, as I say, other priority positions. Um, and there's still players that can, you know, we still ultimately got a young squad, so they're going to improve even more. And I think we can get goals from from more areas as well. Um, and to, to me as well, just with how the whole makeup of the team works, I mean, there's so many questions about where defenders are, are going to play, what midfielders are going to play, um, who we choose to go with up front on a game-by-game -game basis. Is it is it Havertz in the Premier League and maybe Jesus in the Champions League where he's been, you know, historically really, really prolific? So it's exciting. Like, so yeah. many options, so many things that, that can be done. And, like, one, one of the most exciting things for me is just, like, watching how we line up on, a, on the first game of the season and just seeing 
who plays where, what players are moving into what positions, what formation we're in, in possession and out of possession. And I mean, the great thing is, is that we don't need to like, obviously we debate it because we enjoy it, but we don't need to question the manager and say, I think he should do this. I think he should do that. It's so great that we've got a manager where we've got complete trust in and we can just say, I know he's going to make the best decision for the team and for our evolution. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how we evolve. And I think the other thing that we've learned just to kind of wrap up the show is that even if something's not working from the very off, then we owe it to Mikel Arteta now to back off, to get off of his case and to just see how things plan out. Because more often than not, over the long term, he is right. You look at last season, the way it started, people were saying, well, he let Granit Xhaka go and then he brought Kai Havertz in and the balance is off and it's not really working. And maybe, you know, people are justified in saying that was a mistake. But ultimately, Mikel Arteta isn't too stubborn to to figure out when something's not working. And he isn't going to shy away from making a change. And he made the change. And Arsenal had an unbelievable second part of the season. And maybe one more win, one more of those draws in the first half converted into a win and Arsenal would have been Premier League champion. So the margins were so fine. And yeah, you can say, well, if he got it right in the, from the first place, maybe it would have been different. But, mm. you know, over time, he is more often than not right. And over time, he's proven himself to be a really good coach and tactician. And we just got to, as people love to say, trust the process. I bet you Mike, love saying that now. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, Mike, thank you so, so much, mate, for joining me. As always, let people know how they can follow you, what you're up to, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I'm uh, on Twitter or X at Mike underscore Stavrou, um, currently working at The Athletic and on the FC podcast and also going to be working on the Tactics podcast. So cool. I hope to be dropping some Tactics game on here soon <laughs> when I've when I've learned it because it, it's always been something I've, I've interested in, but I've never worked on it directly as, as kind of as kind of my job. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Cool. Sounds exciting. Look forward to your tactical insights over the course of the new season. Uh, don't forget to leave a like on the video if you're watching us. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review as well. That really, really does help. And we'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.